Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. In this video, what we're going to do is cover the fundamentals of Go. So if you want to start learning Go and start being comfortable coding in the Golang programming language, this is the video for you. Golang is a wonderful language and I'm excited to present this course for you. Now let's just go ahead and get right into it. Now the first thing that you're going to need is you're going to need to have Go installed on your machine. In order to do this, just go to go.dev and very simply go to the download section and then download whatever Go version you need for your operating system. I'm on Mac, so this is the one that worked for me. If you're on Windows, this one will work for you. If you're on Linux, then this one will work for you. This is a very simple installation. You just follow a simple wizard and then that is pretty much it. So I'm not going to go ahead and do it because I already did it. Now, once you install it to double check that you have it installed, you can open up your terminal or your command prompt if you're on Windows and you can very simply say go. If you get all this right over here, that means yes, you have go successfully installed. Now, when it comes to Go, we're going to be learning quite a bit and we're going to be coding quite a bit. Now, the text editor that I am going to be uh, using is Visual Studio Code. So these are all of the different things that we are going to learn about. And we're actually going to go ahead and code them out inside of Visual Studio Code. I love VS Code because it comes with this amazing uh, Go extension. So if I go to, if I zoom out a little bit, Let's go here, zoom out a little, zoom out. There we go. We should see the extensions tab right here and we can go ahead and download the Golang extension, which I already have. And it gives you nice syntax highlighting. It also comes with an integrated terminal, which will allow us to run our Go files. So I highly suggest that you use Visual Studio Code. This is a great library to utilize. Now, these are all the different things that we are going to be learning about to understand the fundamentals of Go in future. In the future, I'll make more advanced lectures for more advanced Go concepts. But these are just the fundamentals and some of these are pretty tough to grasp. Now, if you ever want to see this code, do not worry. I'm going to go ahead and host it on GitHub so you can always refer to it and I'll have the link in the description below. So that is that, and I hope you guys enjoy the course and well, enjoy it. Now that we got everything set up, let's go ahead and start learning some Go code. Now, the first thing that we are going to learn about are variables. Now, variables are ways where we can store our data and that data can be variable. Now, if you don't understand this concept, all good. Let's just go ahead and dive right into it. So I went ahead and I opened up VS Code. I created a file. You can call this anything that you want, but I called it 01-variables.go. It needs to have the .go extension for it to be a Go file. And then in here, what we're going to do is we're going to say package main. And do not worry if you don't understand what this is. I'll explain it a little bit later. And then we're going to do import ftm and then over here we're going to say func main and then we're going to do so like that so this is just a function inside of go which i'll talk about in future lectures now essentially what's going on here is when we run this file what is going to happen is it's going to run everything inside of this main block. So this is essentially where we want to run our code. Now this right over here is going to allow us to print some things to the console. So let me go ahead and demo this. So I'm going to say FTM and then over here we're going to say dot print LN. So this is print new line. And then in here I'm going to say hello my friends. So now what I can do is I can open up this new integrated terminal. Let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to say go run. And then I'm going to specify the name of the file. So this is going to be 01-variables.go. 
So I'm going to go ahead and run that. You can see here I get hello, my friend. So again, anything inside of this main function, that is what is going to be executed. And then FTM is just a, it's going to allow us to print something to the console. It also has a bunch of other methods, but we're mainly going to use it just for printing. Okay, so now let's go ahead and talk about variables. So let's say I want to store my favorite book in this code. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, I am going to do that with variables. I'm going to say var, so this is a keyword, var, and then I'm going to say fav book, so favorite book. Now you can notice that this is, uh, uh, so the first letter is uh, lowercase, and then the next letter is capital case. So this is the common convention for creating variables inside of Golang. This is known as a uh, camel case. So the first letter is always lowercase. Every other letter is capital case. So if I were to say var uh, am I cool, you can see here the first letter is uh, lowercase. The next two are capital case. Again, camel case. So I'm going to say var favorite book, fave book is equal to, and let's just say Harry Potter. That is my favorite book. So that's essentially how we go ahead and uh, uh, create variables. Now I can access this variable. So let me go ahead and actually print this out. So I'm going to say ftm dot print new line. And I'm going to say fave book. So let's see what this is gonna get me. Well, it should get me Harry Potter because that is exactly what it is storing. So if I go ahead and run this, as you can see, we have Harry Potter. Okay, so this is looking really, really good. Okay, so what is the next thing? Well, let's say I, you know what, this isn't my favorite book anymore. Well, I can change it. I can always change the value of this variable. I can say now, favorite book is equal to, let's say, Power of Habit. That's actually one of my one of my favorite books. This one, Harry Potter, I actually never read. So now, let me go ahead and print it here. Go ahead and run this code. And you can see we have Harry Potter, and then we have Power of Habits. So what are we doing here? Well, the first thing that we're doing here is we're declaring the variable. So we are declaring the variable and then we are assigning it to this value. So declaring and assigning. So we're assigning it to Harry Potter. Now over here, the variable is already declared. What we can do is we don't have to specify the var again. The variable is already declared. We are just reassigning. That's exactly what we're doing. We're just reassigning the value. Now, what if I try to uh, assign the value or reassign the value to something goofy? Like for example, let's say I try to assign it to fave book is equal to um, 12. Well, you can see that Go is actually giving us some errors. So you can see here, cannot use uh, 12 untyped integer constant as string value in assignment. So what this means is that, well, the type of this variable is a string. Why is it a string? Because when we first assigned it, the value that we assigned it with was the string Harry Potter. And so this variable should always be a string. And any time we try to assign it to something that is not a string, for example, an integer, a number, well, it is going to yell at us. So again, this is something that we can't do. And this is something that is very important to understand. Go is a typed language. So it's not, you know, you can't do stuff like this. It's not loosely typed, it's strongly typed. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment this out. All right, so now let us uh, move on. Now, because Go is a strongly typed language, what we can do here is when we declare a variable, we can also specify the type of this. So let's say I want to specify my other favorite book. And over here, I'm gonna say uh, bad blood. So that's my other favorite book. And over here, I can also specify, and by the way, it's yelling at me just because it's not being used. So if I go ahead here and I print it out, it should 
stop yelling at me. So let's go here. There's no error. So over here, right after the variable, what I can do is actually specify the type of this. So I can specify that this is going to be a string. Now, if for some reason I decide to specify that it's going to be an integer, but then I assign it to a string, you can see that it is yelling at me. Now you might be thinking, well, why in the world do we want to do this? Because as you can see here, Go is able to infer the type without us specifying it. Well, in this case, there's probably no real use case of, uh, of uh, defining the string if we are declaring the variable as well as assigning it to a value. This probably isn't the best idea. It's probably best practice just to let Go infer it. However, there are times when we very simply just want to declare the variable, but we do not want to assign it. So for example, we can do here, let's just go my third favorite book. I guess these they're not really my favorite books if I have so many favorites. So I can say var third favorite book, and that's it. That's all I, I can do. Now over here, I can say third favorite book, and then I can assign it to something else. Now, what I don't want to happen is for me to be able to assign it to like a number. That's not what I want to happen. I'm not sure why this is yelling at me here. Uh, missing variable type. Oh yeah, so that's exactly why it's, it's yelling at me is, is I do not want to go ahead and assign it to something that I don't want it to be, like an integer or a Boolean value or whatever. So over here, we all have to specify the type in this case because we're not assigning it to a value. So in this case, I'm gonna say string. And then over here, when we go ahead and try to assign it to something, well, it's gonna yell at us. So now I can go ahead and change it to whatever I want, a string, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Uh, let me change it to a real book, I'll say diary of wimpy kid. So diary of wimpy kid, nice. All right, and again, it's yelling at me just because it's it's not being used. Now, there's many different types inside of Go. So for example, there is a number type, so I can say integer. Now there's different types of integers. So we have integers, we have floats, which are decimals. We have Boolean values. We have a bunch of different things. I'm gonna go ahead and say integer for this one because it is just the simplest thing. And I can also say var am I cool, and I can specify that this is going to be a Boolean value. Now over here, uh, you can see that over here, I'm going ahead and assigning it, uh, this third favorite book variable, I'm assigning it to this string over here. But the other ones, I'm actually not. And if you don't assign it to anything, it's actually given default values. So for my age, which is an integer, it's going to be given the default value of zero. For am I cool, Boolean, if I don't assign it to something, it's going to give me the default value of false. To prove this to you, let's go ahead here and let's just go ahead and print all these things. So I'm going to print this. And by the way, a string uh, if we don't provide a value for it, it's going to give us the default value of just an empty string. So let's go here. Let's just copy all that stuff. And now let's go ahead and run my code. And so you can see here, diary of Wimpy kid, zero, false. So I'm not, I'm not very cool, unfortunately. Okay, so this is amazing. So now what I want to move on to is uh, compound creation. So sometimes, um, you know, I wanna create multiple variables and I can most definitely do them like this. Uh, but sometimes, you know, this, this is just way too long. I just wanna create multiple variables very, very quickly. And we can actually do that in one line. So we can say here var and then I can say var my, let's say my favorite number. And let's say I also want to store not only my favorite number, I also want to store my favorite chocolate as well as my favorite team. Now again, I can al always do something like this var and then favorite chocolate and I can say Kit Kat. And then over here I can say var uh, favorite team this is like an NBA team. I'm gonna say the Knicks for this. I can always do this. This this is completely valid. 
but I can also do something like this. I'm going to comment this out because I'm going to use the same things here. I can say var and then I can say favorite number and then comma favorite chocolate and then comma favorite team. And I can say that that is going to be equal to 27 is my favorite number. And then Kit Kat is my favorite uh, 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 chocolate. And then lastly, the Knicks are my favorite team. So this is also completely valid. And this is known as compound creation. So uh, we're creating multiple variables uh, uh, in a compound fashion, I guess. All right, let's go ahead and actually write that down. I'm gonna say compound, compound creation. Okay, amazing. Now, another way that we can do this, so we can do this actually in multiple different ways, we can also do block creation. So if we're not really a fan of this syntax, let's go here, I'm gonna say block creation. So if we're not a fan of the syntax, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, comment it out, copy, comment it out, and then I'm gonna paste it. So what we can do here is right after the var, we can actually create a, we can have two parentheses and then enter. And then this right here is gonna be our block. So I'm gonna say my favorite number is equal to 27. And then I can say my favorite chocolate is equal to uh, Kit Kat. Kit Kat. And lastly, I can say my favorite team is equal to the Knicks. So this is if I prefer to just have it, you know, in a block rather than just a, a, a line like so. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Now this is somewhat similar to this, but this, I don't have to specify the var keyword every single time. Now again, it's yelling at me because I am not uh, using the value. So let's just go ahead and print them out so I don't have that uh, yelling at me anymore. So I'm gonna say print new line. No, no, I do not want to do that. Now let's just go ahead and print them. Let's just see that they actually end up working. And over here you can see seven, KitKat, Nix. Okay, so this is looking a-okay. All right, so now let's actually move on. Let's say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, well, I'm not always, but let's say I am very frequently assigning and uh, well, declaring and assigning variables. Um, there's actually a shortcut to do this. So if you want to declare and assign a variable uh, and not just declare a variable, instead of using the var keyword, what you can do here is let's say favorite animal. Now I want to get my favorite animal. Uh, you typically, let's say my favorite animal is a tiger. I would just say var tiger var favorite animal is equal to tiger. This is typically what I would do, but there is a shortcut for this uh, because I am uh, declaring as well as assigning, I can just remove this var keyword. Now this isn't going to work like so. What we need to do is right before the equal sign, add a colon. So over here we can say var animal colon equals tiger. And this is completely equivalent to using var. Again, just to prove to you that it works, let's just do a, a print. I'm gonna print in this variable. Tiger. Okay, so this is amazing. Now, uh, of course, we can actually do kind of the, the same thing in terms of, uh, in terms of the compound creation with this declaration as well. So what I can do here is I can say, for example, let's say I have multiple pets. I have pet one and I can say here, pet two, pet three, and then I can say colon is equal to, and then over here I can say cat, and then I can do comma dog, and then I can say comma rat, like so. And if I go ahead and let me just print these pets, this works a-okay. So let's go ahead and just print all this. You should see cat, dog, rat. Now in terms of uh, 
so this right here again is a declaration and assignment. Now, one thing that we cannot do is something like this pet two and then declare and then assign is equal to parrot. This, this is not going to work. We can reassign by doing something like so that works. However, if we are going to use uh, this kind of syntax where we have the commas, this actually is a okay. So we can declare and assign something that already exists. So for example, let's say I want to declare and assign parent uh, pet four, but I also want to reassign pet three by using the comma. I can actually do that. So I can say pet three. And then over here I can say, um, I don't know, whale. A whale is my pet. So let's go here. And now what I'm going to do is just print out all of the pets, print them out. Now you can see here that it got reassigned. So, so it's, it, we can't actually do this syntax if we're using the commas. All right. And that is pretty much all it is that we need to know about um, uh, variables. There is one more variable I do want to talk about, and those are constants. So right here, when we define variables, typically we, read, we either use this syntax or we use var. But another thing that we can actually use is const. So let's just go here and just say constants. So we can use const and I can say my name. So let's say my name is always going to be my name. That is a constant. It's not going to change. So if this is something that is not going to change, we can actually add const here. I'm going to say lath. And then if I try to, let's say my name is equal to um, Sarah, we can see here that it yells at me because, well, this is a constant. I cannot change it. So again, if there's something that a variable that's not going to ever change values, it's best to use a constant. All right. So that pretty much sums up variables. I hope that is nice and clear. And now we're going to move on to the next section. Welcome everybody to a brand new section. In this section, we are going to talk about operators. Now, instead of explaining exactly what an operator is, Let's just go ahead and dive into Go code, and I'm sure you guys will understand it once we see some examples. So I went ahead and I created this operators file, so o2-operators.go. I'm going to go ahead and just copy the uh, package main, import fmn, fmt, and then the function, because we're going to need that. And let's just go ahead and create it like so. Now, so far we have learned how to declare variables. So for example, let's say I want to declare just a random number, let's say num1, and I can say that this is equal to four. So I'm declaring and assigning. Now I can also do num2 is equal to three. Now, what if what I want to do is I want to have another variable that is the sum of both of these values. So as you can imagine, I can do var sum and one possibility is for me to just manually add these two up and say that, okay, well, this is going to be seven. However, obviously this isn't a great idea because the value of these variables could be, well, variable. We do not know exactly what they are. So an, another option is just to very simply add up num1 plus num2. And this is where we are going to start using operators. Now, specifically, there's different types of operators, but for this, we're going to use arithmetic operators. So arithmetic operators and the arithmetic operators that exist are the plus sign. We also have the minus sign. We have this uh, dash, which is the divide. We have the stars. We also have uh, the um, this uh, percentage that I'll talk about a little bit later. But over here, what we can very simply do now is just say num1 plus num2. And that is going to give us the sum. And it's going to uh, uh, assign, assign that value to this variable over here. All right, let's go ahead and just quickly test this out. Let's just say print new line. I'm going to say sum. Let's go ahead and open up our integrated terminal. 
and I'm going to go ahead and run this time a new file. So O2 operators.go. And as you can see here, we get seven. Awesome. Okay. Now, of course, as I said, we have multiple operators. So if we want, let's say the difference, so the difference, which is just the, uh, well, the difference between the two numbers, it's going to be a num1 minus num2. And if I were to print out the difference, I will get the difference. Let's just go ahead and do all the operators and we'll print them out. Now, if I want to divide two operators and I want to get the uh, quotient, so we can say quotient, that's going to be num1 divided by num2. And if I want to get the product, which is multiplication, I can say var product is equal to num1 and then over here the star is times num2 and let me just go ahead and print this and i'll show you exactly what this uh, percentage sign does so let's go over here and let's go here and let's go ahead and run this code and now you can see we get seven, which is the sum, one, which is the, the difference. Now over here, you might be thinking, why in the world are we getting uh, uh, one? Well, that's because this right here is of type integer and it's not of type float. Uh, so that's why we're not getting any decimal points. So the, the reason why over here is if we wanted to do that, you would have to assign this to a particular float number. So I can say here float. And now if I were to divide it, you can see we actually get um, decimals like so. All right, and then the product is gonna be 12. Now let's talk about this percentage sign. This is just allowing us to get the remainder. So over here, let's just say var remainder. I'm gonna say that this is going to be equal to, and I'm gonna say num1, and then I'm going to say percent sign and then two. So num one percent sign two. And I believe the reason why this is not working is that this has to be an integer over here. So invalid operator, da, 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 da. So let's just go ahead and remove this for now. Just keep it as an integer. And what this is going to give us is the remainder. So num1 is uh, so num1 is four, which is an even number. So how many times can we get a two into four? Well, we can get it two times, and the remainder is going to be zero. So if I were to go ahead and run this, you can see we get zero. Uh, now, if I were to use num2, well, I can only fit one two in there, and the remainder we're going to have a remainder which is one. So over here, we should have a value of one. Now, if I decide for some reason to put like 77, well, we can fit no 77 values into three and the remainder is gonna be three at this case. So let's go here, as you can see, three. So that's pretty much all it is for uh, arithmetic operators. They're not very complicated. So now let's actually move on to relational operators. So let's go here. I'm gonna say relational operators. So let's say uh, operators. So let's say what we want to do, and we want to see which number is bigger. Uh, right now, obviously we can clearly see that number one is bigger, but maybe we don't have the values or maybe it's not that transparent. So it, it could be, you know, we could assign this to something else. So it could be like num one is equal to number of uh, products. And then over here, num2 could be like number of whatever. And we want to see which one's bigger, right? Because we, we obviously we can't see it's like uh, because we don't see the value at this point. So what we can do here is we can use relational operators. So let's go here and let's just say var result. Uh, var result and let's say I want to see if num1 is bigger than num2 now to do this well as you can imagine we're going to use this relational operator right over here 
And what this expression over here is going to eventually yield is a Boolean value. So a Boolean value is either going to be true or false. So if num1 is greater than num2, then the value is going to be true, else it's going to be false. So let's go here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a print. So print new line. Let's go ahead and print that result. And again, this is going to yield a Boolean value. As you can see, true. Uh, another thing that we can do is, well, let's see. Let's actually go ahead and change num2 to four. And let's just think about what this is gonna give us. So let's go ahead here. And this is gonna give us false because what's happening here is, well, no, num2 is not greater, or num1 is not greater than num2 because, well, this is four and then this is four as well. Let's say we only want to check if it is greater than or equal to. Well, in this case, I can just say greater than and then equal to like so. And this should yield us uh, true. Let's go ahead and move this back to three. Let's say I want to see if, uh, if uh, num one is less than num two. Over here, I can just say this expression, as you can see, or I can also add less than or equal to like that. I'm not gonna go ahead and run it because you probably get this. Now, another uh, relational operator is I want to check if uh, num1 is strictly equal to num2, not greater than, not less than, just equal to. Well, I for this, I can use two equal signs. Now, over here, we use one equal sign for, of course, assigning a value to a variable, two equal sign is a relational operator just to check if two values are exactly the same. You can also check if they're not equal, which in this case is true. If I go ahead and run this, we should get true because num1 is four, this one is three. So those are relational operators. Very, very simple stuff. Let's go ahead and move on to the last set of operators, which is logical operators. So I'm gonna go ahead here, just say logical operators. And now logical operators are a way that we can combine different expressions. So over here, this is an expression right here. So let's say what I want to do is I want to check, for example, um, let's go ahead and create two new variables here. I'm going to say const name, and I'm going to say that my, the name is Lath and var age, I'm going to say 25, something like that. So let's say what I want is I want to check if, uh, um, I want to check if, you know, you're allowed to get invited to my party. So let's go ahead here. I'm going to say var invite to party. Now let's say that I am very strict with the people that I can invite to my party. I only want people that have the same name as me and are older than 23. So I just want to have a bunch of lathes in the party. And the, we cannot have any 10 year old lathes. We want to make sure they're all older than 23. How do we do this? Well, as you can see here, we have two different expressions that we have to uh, create. So let's just go ahead and create them right here. So the first expression is, well, the name has to equal lathe. Now the second expression is, well, the age has to be greater than 23. So somehow what we need to do is we need to combine these together and we need to check that both of these are true. So if one of these is false, we just want the overall inv invite to party value to be false as well. Well, we can do that with a logical operator. Specifically, we can do that with the and logical operator because what we want is we want this to be true and we want this to be true. So over here, I'm going to say that that is going to be equal to name is equal to lathe. And then the and operator is just very simply two ands like so. And then I can say age is greater than 23. So let's just go ahead and give this a quick test by doing a quick little print here. So invite to party, maybe we can call this invited to party. This is a Boolean value. 
And you can see here that this is returning true. Why? Well, because the name is equal to length and the age is 25. If I were to change this to, um, I don't know, let's say uh, Lawton. Well, this is going to return false because this expression right over here is going to return false. This one's going to return true because the age is 25. But because we have the and, we need both of them to be true. So let's go ahead and run this. You can see now we get false. All right, this is looking pretty good. So that is the and operator. Let's say that this is just way too restrictive. You know, I don't, you know, it just turns out that I'm the only person in the party. Uh, it's just not great. So what I want is, okay, well, of course I'm going to be invited to the party. So name is equal to lathe. So your name could either be lathe or if your name is not lathe, then, well, I want your age to be larger than 23. So to do this, what I can actually do here is use the or operator. So again, what this means is that, um, well, if your name is equal to lathe, this is going to return true. And let's say your age is not greater than 23. With the or operator, we just want one of these to be true. So if this is true, it's going to kind of override this and the overall expression is going to return true. Now let's just go ahead and prove this to you by saying um, 12. And then over here, see, it is returning true. Now another thing that I can do is just change the name and make this older than 23 and that should also return true. All right, looking good. Okay, so that is the OR. And the last one that I want to talk about is the NOT operator. So let's say I want to absolutely ensure that I am not invited in to my own party because I am very boring. So what I can do here is I can make sure that the age is greater than 23. So I can add an AND here. And then over here, I can actually just wrap this in parentheses and say NOT. So this expression overall, what it's going to do, it's going to return true because length is equal to length. But then with this uh, exploitation point, I'm going to revert the Boolean value from true to false. Now, if this right here was actually false, it's going to revert it from false to true. So over here, I'm just simply saying your name is not equal to length and your age is greater than 23. So this actually is going to return if I were to, I didn't save it, sorry. If I were to save it, you can see it returns false. If I change my name now, you can see that now it returns true. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And we can actually do a lot of kind of complicated things. We can really combine these things together. So one thing that I can do here is let's say what I want is, okay, I want... If your name is equal to length, you're not invited to the party and you have to be between the age of 21 and 90. We don't want anybody over 91 years old at the party. That's just way too old. So what we can actually do here is say and and then over here we can have parentheses and then we can have another expression in here. So we can say age is, let's say, greater than uh, greater than or equal to 21, and then and, and then age is less than 90. So what's going to happen here is because we wrap this in parentheses, it's just going to resolve this expression right over here. And in this case, well, the age is greater than 25 uh, or is greater than 21, and it's less than 90. So overall, this is going to return true. And the name is, well, in this case, the name is Lathe. Uh, so this one's going to return false. So overall, the expression is going to return false. So let's just go here. You can say false. Now, if I were to change this to something else, uh, you can see that it returns true. Now, if my age is, let's say, 16, if I change the age to 16, you can see that this is going to return false because overall, this expression is going to return false. So those are operators. So I hope that uh, makes sense and I hope that was a fun lecture. All right, my good friends, let's go ahead and move on to if else statements and how we can utilize this in Go. 
So just as a quick reminder, at the very bottom over here, we had a bunch of conditions just to either yield us true or false and assign it to this variable invited to party. However, maybe if you are invited to the party, we want to do some action, maybe print something to the console over here. So how could we do that? Because again, right here, all this does is just return a true or false value. Well, this is where we use if else statements to just check if a statement is true, I want to perform some action else. I want to perform something else. Let's go ahead and see this in action. I'm going to go ahead and create another go file. And as per usual, let's go ahead and copy these three lines. Close this off, close this line right over here. And in here, we're all going to write our code. So what do we want? Well, let's go ahead and create a variable. And I'm going to say this variable is going to be age. So I'm going to say age, let's say 34. Now, what I want to do is if you are over the age of 23, I want to let you know that you are invited to the party. You are allowed in. And how do I want to do that? Well, I want to use this library right over here to print something to the console saying that you are allowed in. So what is the uh, expression that we need to create here? Well, the expression is something that looks like this. Is age greater than or equal to 23? Now, in this case, well, again, we want to log something. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use an if. So what's going to happen here is we're saying if the age is greater than 23, then we're going to have curly braces and we're going to run everything inside of this block of code. Now, specifically, what I want to do is I want to say uh, print line. I'm going to say you are allowed in or in like so. So if I went ahead and let's just go ahead and run this file. So I'm going to say go run 03 and I'm going to say if else else dot go. And you can see here we have you are allowed in. Now, if I went ahead and uh, change this to 14, this is going to be false and thus it's not going to hit this block. So let's go here. You can see here we get nothing. Now, what is the else statement? So right after the if, we can actually have an else. And as you can imagine, this is going to be the case where, well, we don't catch anything inside of the if. This is kind of the, the everything else. Everything else that happens, we'll just catch it over here. Now, the else block essentially means at this point is that, hey, you are, well, younger than 23. So we're going to say frig off, Ricky. If you guys get that reference, let me know. It's probably one of the best shows of all time. So let's just go ahead here. And now you can see we get frig off. Okay, cool. Now let's say we have multiple different conditions. Maybe we just don't have one condition. We want to check for multiple conditions. Well, we can use the else if uh, statement. So let's go ahead and use that. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. And let's say for this condition, we also want to check if you are older than 20. So if you're older than 20, we want to give you just some, some encouragement telling you, Hey, you're almost allowed to come to the party. Just wait a few years, be patient. So to do that right uh, after the if statement and before the else, I'm going to say else if, and then over here, we're going to have another condition. So we're going to say age is greater than 20. And then let's go ahead and do something here. Now I believe it's yelling at me because we got to do a like, so and over here, I'm going to say almost there. So what's going to happen here with the else if is it's going to go ahead and check the age. If the age meets, meets this condition, then anything below it is not going to be called. So anything below it is not going to be called. It's just going to go ahead and call this. However, if it doesn't meet this condition, then it's going to check this condition. And if it meets this condition, anything below it is not going to be called. And below it, 
doesn't just have to be an else statement. We can have multiple else if statements to check multiple conditions. And then if well, if it doesn't meet this condition and then over here it reaches the else, the else is going to be called. So let's go ahead and give this a quick go. Uh, so let's go here. Let's change the age to 25. So 25, it should just reach this block and not call any of the other blocks. So let's go here. As you can see, we, we got you are allowed in. Uh, we get it twice because we call it here and here. So let me just go ahead and comment this out. You can see we are allowed in. Now, if I went ahead and changed this to like 22, we get almost there. If I change it to 19, we get frig off. And that is the basics of if else statements. You're gonna be using them all over while you're programming life. Every single programming language utilizes if else statements. They're very, very important. Now that we talked about if else statements, I'm going to talk about switch statements that are very similar. So let's say that we have a lot of different conditions that we want to check. Now, in this case, we're going to have to create a lot of if else if else statements, and you can see that it can get pretty long. Well, in cases like these, we can actually use switch statements. So switch statements are just very simply a different way where we can perform the exact same thing, but syntactically it might be nicer if we have a lot of conditions that we want to check. So for example, let's go over here and let's create a brand new variable. And by the way, I created a new file and I just have this boilerplate. And let's go ahead and this variable is called animal and I'm gonna say animal is equal to cat. So depending on what the animal is, what I want to do is console.log what that animal would typically say to the terminal. Now we can have multiple animals. We can have cats, dogs, horses, frogs, etc. And having an if else statement can get really, really long. This is again where we use a switch statement. So we can say switch and then we want to switch on, well, whatever it is we want to switch on. So this is right here, the condition. Then we have curly braces. And then over here we say case, and then we say cat. And then we do colon. Let me go ahead and tabulate this better. And then right below, we can go ahead and print out whatever it is that we want. So I can say here, uh, print out meow. So what we're doing here is we're checking if the animal if the, if the animal is equal to cat, then we want to print this out. So this is extremely similar to an if statement. We can just do if animal is equal to cat, then we can go ahead and print out, print out meow. So print out meow. But you can see that this is a little bit cleaner. Now this is more code. Uh, for now, but just watch when we start adding more conditions. So over here, I can say case dog this time. And let's just do print woof. And then over here, case, let's say frog. And let's print out ribbit. And lastly, let's do case horse. And let's print out uh, nay. Now, if we try to do that here, we're going to have to do else if. We have to repeat animal every single time. Say animal is equal to uh, dog. And then over here, we do print new line, woof, like so. Now, as you can imagine, we we're going to have to do, I'm not going to go ahead and type this out. I'm just going to add the equivalent else if statements. You can see that this is kind of messy. It's not really that elegant. Whereas this one, it's, it's, it's pretty elegant and it's, uh, it's definitely less code. So this is, uh, what we probably want to do if we have very simple, uh, statements that we want to check and we have quite a few of them. So let's go ahead and get rid of this now. 
Now you might be thinking, well, what about the default case? What if the uh, the um, the animal is not either cat, dog, horse, or frog? Maybe it's uh, a salamander or whatever. Well, in this case, we can have something similar to an else block, but well, we call we call it default. So in this case, we can just catch all if we don't catch them here, and then we can just say, oh, I'm not even using. Uh, Let's just go ahead and import FTM. There we go. Print new line. Print new line meow. Let's go ahead and fix that. Apologies for that. And over here in the default, we can just say, don't know the animal. That's it. And that right there is a switch statement. Let's go ahead, go run. And I'm going to say 04-switch.go. You can see we get meow in this case. If I were to change this to a horse, we should get horse, nay. That's what we get. I change it to something that we don't know, like let's say a bear. Uh, we get don't know that well that animal. There we go. And that's pretty much it. In this video, what we're gonna do is talk about loops and how we can perform loops inside of GoLang. Now, what are loops and why do we want to use them? Well, loops are used when we want to run a snippet of code multiple times. So let me go ahead and show you an example. Let's go over here. Let's create a new file. I'm going to call this 05 loops. So 05 loops.go. And over here, let's just copy what we need. Let's copy all that. Let's go over here. Let's close that off. Okay. So let's say what I want to do is I want to print every number from one to 10. Of course, I can do this manually. I can just go print a new line one and you get the point. I can just keep going like so. Then over here, I can just change this to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then nine, 10. Now you can see here that I am running the same code every single time, multiple times. Now, again, this is only one line of code, but there could be cases where we want to run blocks of code multiple times. This right here is where we would ideally use a loop. So a loop, what it does is it's going to loop through an iteration and it is going to call a block of code and run a block of code based on a condition. So what's the condition here? Well, I want to loop from number one to 10 and then I want to console this output right over here. So let's just go ahead and do this inside of a loop. So in a loop, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the for keyword, so for. Now this for keyword is gonna take in uh, multiple different things. So bear with me if this doesn't make much sense. The first thing that it's going to take in is a new uh, variable that we are going to assign. Initially, I'm gonna assign i to be equal to one. And then we're gonna do colon. And then the second part is going to be the condition. So, so long as i is less than or equal to 10, then we want to run this loop. And then after we run each loop, what I want to do is I want to increase i by one. And then over here, this is the block of code that we are going to run. So I'm going to run fm.printNewLine i. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm gonna say go run 05 loops dot go. And as you can see here, we get every single number from one to 10. Now let's just go ahead and go through this one more time, just in case that this doesn't make sense. So over here, we have this for loop, and this is the only way that we can loop through things in Go is by specifying for. 
Now the first thing, the first part that we're doing is we are creating this variable and we're assigning it to the number one. And then over here, this is the condition of when to run the loop. So as long as I is less than or equal to 10, go ahead and run this loop. And by the end of each loop, what I want to do is I want to increment I. So as soon as this loop ends, we're going to increment I from one to two. And eventually I is going to reach 11. It's not going to pass this condition and thus the loop is going to terminate. So that's pretty much what we can do with loops. Very, very simple. Now there are multiple ways that we can actually use for to define our loops. So for example, what we can do here is instead of having this part right over here, we can just go ahead and declare the variable above. So we can say J is equal to one. And then over here, we can just very simply say four. And then we can say four J, J is less than or equal to 10. And then we can run the exact same thing. So we can run the exact same thing this time with J of course. And then over here we can say J plus plus. So this in essence is doing the exact same thing. So this and this are pretty much the exact same thing, except here we are declaring and assigning inside of the loop. Whereas this one we're declaring and assigning outside our condition is right over here condition right here. And then our increment is right over here. So at the end of the logic, we are incrementing over here at the end of the loop, we are incrementing. So again, in effect, if I comment this out, we should still get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. As you can see, everything is a okay. Starting at one going to 10. So that right there is actually known as a while loop because this right here actually could be a little bit dangerous because what could happen here is this condition can never get met. So let's say by accident, instead of saying J plus plus, I say J minus minus. And so we are actually going to be decrementing a J and thus it's always going to be less than 10. And thus this loop will always and always run. And we're going to get some weird funky behavior inside of our machine because our machine is just going to continuously process this loop. And it is known as an infinite loop because it's going to continuously run and run. Obviously, this is something that we don't want. I could demo it, but I don't want my machine to go bad. So I'm not going to do that. Um, another way that we can actually define a, um, a uh, for loop is actually not having the condition here at all. So let me go ahead and comment this out. Let's go ahead and define another variable. I'm going to say, let's say K, and I'm going to say that this is going to be equal to one and we can just say four and then we can just go like this. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to cause an infinite loop. Uh, there is no condition. So it's going to continuously go and go and go. So what I can do here is I can just say print K. So print K. And of course I can do K plus plus, but well, there is no condition. Well, what I can do if I wanted to is just add the condition right inside of the loop. So I can say if let's say K is well, let's just continue what we had before. So less than, less than or equal to, and we can probably put this, should probably put this above. So if K is less than or equal to, uh, uh, or actually no, let's say if K is greater than 10 in this case, then what I want to do is I want to break, and this is going to break out of the loop. So again, in essence, exact same thing that we are doing here, just syntactically, it's a little bit different. This right here is our condition. So let's just go here. And as you can see, one to 10. All right, so that is pretty much it. Uh, there is one last thing that I do wanna show you. I'm gonna go ahead and copy, let's go ahead and copy, uh, you know, let's just go ahead and create another loop. And this one's going to be just a four and let's just say R is less than a hundred. And for this loop, all I want to do is I want to print out, um, all of the odd numbers. I don't want to print out any of the even numbers. So there's multiple different ways, of course, that I can do this. I can have an if else statement, which I actually will. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to say here, I want to print. So let's say I want to print new line and I want to print R and over here, of course, we're going to increment R because 
uh, then in this case, it's kind of it's going to be an infinite loop. However, if so, if uh, R modulo or percent, that's what it's called, modulo two. Remember, we talked about this. Let me go ahead and get rid of these brackets. Is equal to zero. Then what I want to do is I don't even want to hit this block of code right over here. I just want to go ahead and move on to the next loop. So what I can do here is I can just say R plus plus, and then I can say continue, continue. So don't even hit this block of code. Just go ahead and continue. So let's go ahead and run this. And in this case, we should get all of the odd numbers. And as you can see, that is exactly what we get. In this video, what we're going to do is learn about functions. Functions are things that allow us to run block of code repeatedly throughout our code. So let me go ahead and show you an example. I created a new file and let's say in here we're writing some complex algorithm. So let me go ahead here. I'm coding. Let's say these comments are code. And then right over here in line nine, I have to create a loop that counts down from a certain number. And then it just prints each number to the console. So we've done that before. Let's go ahead and quickly create that. I'm going to say I is equal to, let's say 10. And then I'm going to say I is going to be less than zero. That's the condition. And then I minus minus. And then over here, I'm going to do print line and I'm going to print I like so. So over here, we have this nice block of code and then I move on. I do more coding, more coding. And then I have to do that exact same, uh, uh, th that exact same feature, that exact same piece of logic. So what I do is, well, I just go ahead and implement it. Let's say this time we have to count down from five and then I go ahead, I do more coding, you know, more. And let's say I have to do that feature again, that logic again. And let's say this time it's from 20. So I have to count down from 20. So do you guys see a problem with this? Because I do. We are repeating the code multiple times, even though we're counting down by, uh, by a different number each time, the logic is exactly the same. So what we can actually do is encapsulate this logic inside of a function, just like this one over here, and very simply call that function. So let's go ahead and define a function. So a function is defined by the func keyword, and then we can call our function whatever it is that we want. I'm going to call it countdown, just something nice and descriptive. So let's go here. Let's call it countdown like so. And let's actually just make it all lowercase or, you know what, countdown. Let's make it camel case because it's two separate words technically. Okay. So over here we have our wonderful function. And now what I want to do is I want inside of this function, this is the block of code that I want to run. However, I have no idea what this number could be. So when I call this function, what I want to do is I want to pass into it a parameter and that is going to be this number because it could be variable. So over here, let's just say num and I'm going to define this as an integer. So I'm going to say this parameter is always going to be an integer. Then over here, instead of hard coding 10, I'm just going to say num. So that is pretty much the premise of a function. So over here, instead of, uh, instead of uh, having this for loop, what I can do now is I can just call this function like so. So this is how we call it. And then in it, we're going to pass in 10. And then over here, we can pass in five. And then lastly, over here, we can pass in 20. And that is it. So if we go ahead and we run this. So let's go here, let's do a clear. And then I'm going to do go run and then O six and then functions dot go. You can see that it is running. So you can see it's counting down from 10 to, to one and then here from five to one and then here from 20 to one. 
So that right there is the premise of functions. So let's go ahead and explore a little bit more about functions. So let's say I want a function that is going to sum up uh, two numbers and then return the value. Well, what we can do now is, well, let's add a add numbers function. And this is gonna take in two parameters, num1, which is gonna be an integer, and then comma num2, which is also going to be integer. And it's also going to return an integer. Over here, this didn't return anything. It just consoled something to the terminal. But this is going to return a value. So I'm going to specify that it's going to return an integer. And very simply, what we can do now is just say sum is going to be equal to num1 plus num2. And then I can return using the return keyword, the sum. So over here, let's go ahead and call add number with five and five. And because we're returning it, we can actually assign this to a variable. So let me go ahead and say um, the sum is equal to whatever is returned here. And then I can say uh, FTM dot print new line and I can say the sum like so. So let's go ahead and open that up. Let's run this again. And as you can see, we get 10. Uh, and if I were to remove this return variable, then eventually this, this, this thing isn't going to return anything. So let's just see what happens here. Uh, let's just, now this is unused. Uh, so yeah, so let's just go ahead and just print both of these out. So I'm going to say sum like so. And it's giving us an error because we're not returning anything. So let's just get rid of this. You can see here right away we're getting, hey, there's no value being returned. Uh, so you can't really assign it to a variable. So that's the, the premise of the return keyword. In this section, we are going to talk all about structs. So I went ahead and I created a new file and I added the boiler plate. Now, sometimes what we want to do is we want to group data together. So, so far we have created variables. And for example, we may have created a variable that is an animal and then we just assign it to a particular value. But what if we want to have more information about that animal? So for example, maybe we want to have the animals, um, the animals class. So what class does this animal fall into? The animal's age, the animal's gender, things of that nature. So what can we do here? So let's say we have an animal, their name is Ted, and I can say Ted class, that is something that I could definitely do, just have a new variable for every single one. And then over here I can say Ted age, and then over here I can have 24, and then I can have another variable, Ted um, gender. So gender. And then over here, I'm going to say true for female and then false for male. So this is a Boolean value. So you can see this is one way that I can do that. And if I want to have another uh, animal, we can have another set of variables. But you can see that this is kind of messy. And right here, this block right over here is really just for one particular animal, the animal Ted. And this block over here is for another animal, let's say the animal, uh, I don't know, Tuco. So what we can do is we can actually group this data together with structs. So let's go ahead and work with that. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to actually define our struct. Now to do that, we're going to say type and then we're going to say animal. So this is a type and we're saying animal with, the, with a capital case because it's a type. And then we're going to say struck. And then over here, we're just going to define the different fields as well as those associated types that we can have for any particular animal. So class, string, age. This is going to be an integer. And then we're going to have the gender, which is going to be a Boolean value. So that right there is just the type of the struct. And now what we can do is we can say var and let's say Teddy and we can say that this is going to be equal to animal 
and then we do curly braces and we define all of the different uh, fields. So we can say here class and I can say bear and age and then we can say 24 and then gender and I can say true for female. So that is pretty much it. Very, very simple. So let's go ahead and just go uh, try to log this to the console. So let's do import uh, FMT. Uh, let's go FMT dot print new line. Then let's print Teddy. So let's go here. And now what we can do is we can just say go run. And then we can say 07 structs dot go and you can see we get this structure right over here so we get bear 24 and true so rather than having you know three separate variables we can just group them together into one variable with this structure and what we can actually do that's pretty cool is we don't have to get the whole thing we can actually get a particular field if we want to so let's say i want you know the age field I can go ahead and, and get that by saying dot age. If I want the, uh, the class, I can say dot class. So again, if I run that, you can see now I just get 24 and then bear as well. Another thing that's really cool is that we can read and write these. So we have read them, but we can also change the value of these. So I can go here and I can say teddy.age is equal to teddy.age plus one. So he increased in age. Uh, I can change the class. Maybe we found out that he wasn't a bear. Maybe he was something else. So we can, of course, do all these things. And if I go ahead and just print this out, it should go from 24 to 25 as it does like so. Okay, so that is pretty much the premise uh, for the rest of this lecture. I'm just going to go ahead and show you different ways that we can define uh, structs. So let's just go ahead and do that. So another way that we can define a struct is let's say we have another animal called Leo. We can say animal and instead of defining the field, we can just straight up define the the values of these fields but they have to be in order so they have to be class age and then gender so over here i can say lion so lion i can say two and i can say false for male i'm going to go ahead and just grab this log here and just so we don't have an unused variable let's just go log leo so this is the exact same way. It's going to result in the exact same thing. Now, if you want to, for some reason, and there's probably no reason you want to do this, but you want to switch up the order. Well, in that case, this is where you would want to use the uh, field name. So over here, you can see the order doesn't matter because we're specifying the field name. Whereas here, the order does matter because we are not specifying the field name. You can see it's yelling about the types because it's expecting that the second thing is going to be an integer, but we're providing it with a Boolean. Okay, so that is just another way we can do things. So that is looking a okay. Another thing that we can actually do is we can just say, let's say another animal, let's say Lalo, and we can just say animal like so. And then over here, we can just provide absolutely nothing. So Let's just say Lalo. And what ends up happening is like a string, it's just going to provide the default value. So the, f the field class is just going to be an empty string. The gender is going to be false. And then the age is going to be zero. Later on, what we can do is very simply just say Lalo dot class is equal to, I don't know, let's just say lion again. So just to prove to you that uh, this is what we get, you can see here we get lion zero false. Now, if I don't assign this, we should just get an empty string, which we don't really see here. Okay. Uh, so that, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, another way that we can define it is by not actually using the type. We can just use an anonymous structure and we can define it by doing something like this. So we can say var, let's say Tuco. I'm using better call Saul characters now, if you ever watched that show. We can just say struck 
and then we can say class string and then age and then integer and then gender uh, boolean so now we're not using any animal we're just defining it as is and as you can imagine this is completely fine uh, what's going to end up happening is it's just going to use the defaults now if you want to uh, create this anonymous structure and assign the fields values we can just do do it like this so we can say class whatever and then uh, we can say we can say uh, age is whatever and then we can say the gender and we have a syntax error here actually no I don't think it works that way with var but what we can do is if we actually change this to um, if we change this to the create and assign like so that's when we can do that so over here now we can define it so you can just say penguin let's say and then age is one and then gender is false all right and that is it so we can end that off with a comma and i'm not going to go ahead and bother console.logging it I, I hope you guys get the point okay so those are structs in this section, we are going to talk about arrays. Arrays are ways where we can store multiple units of the same data. So for example, let's say I want to track all my purchases and I want to store them somewhere. Well, I would do that inside of an array. So let me go ahead and demo exactly how. Over here inside of my main function, let's say again, I want to store all of my purchases just so I can be, you know, more cognizant of what I am spending. Now, in order to do that, what I would do is I would say purchases and then colon equals to assign and to declare. And then I would say, well, these brackets right over here. So this is going to signify an array. And then inside of the bracket, I'm going to specify how many items I want to store in here. So essentially how many purchases I have made. So I'm going to say five purchases. And then right after that, I'm going to specify the type because you can only store one specific type inside of an array. You can't have an array that has Boolean values and then another values an integer value, etc. Now for this, because they're purchases and we're dealing with money, I'm going to say float so I can have decimal points. And then, well, that is just defining how many floats we have in our array. But now we actually need to assign our values. To do that, we do curly braces, and then we just start assigning our values. So let's say I spent 19.99, and then I do comma, uh, 20.99, and then I do, uh, 5.99 and I do 1.99 and then I do 14.99 so that is how we do that that is how we store our array now if I go ahead and I do an a print let's go ahead and print that out just see how that looks like let's go here let's close these two off let's just clear this and let's go 08 arrays. And now when I run that, you can see we get a list, an array of purchases that I have made. Each particular purchase, each particular item is a float value. Now what's nice about arrays is I can access specific uh, uh, points. So over here, what I can say is maybe I want to get item three or let's just say purchase three. So let's say I want to get this third one. What I can do is I can say that is going to be equal to and I can create and assign this that is going to be equal to purchases. And then I specify the index of that particular element. Now, the index is the location where that element lives in the array. 
So in Go, we always start with a zero index. So this very first item right over here has an index of zero. And then this one has an index of one. This one has an index of two, three, four. So over here, if I want to get this third element, then I'm going to get it at the index of two. Because remember, zero, one, two. So let's go here and let's just say purchase three. And now I can access that element, as you can see, right there. Now let's say I made a mistake. I put 599 when it really should have been 1599. So I can actually reassign this particular value in the array at this index. So to do that, I can just say purchases at index of two, I want to reassign it to 1599. And now if I were to run that, you can see it is 1599. Okay, now another way that we can create an array is by using the var keyword. And so this will allow us to create an array without assigning it to anything. So I can say var and let's just say sales and I can say income or sorry, var in sorry, var sales is going to be equal to. And then over here I can specify, let's say four and then float just like so. So that is relatively simple, something that I can do. As you can see, my cat being a little crazy. So let's go here. And wow, he's insane. He's just running around now like a mad madman. All right, so let's see what's going on here. So expected expression, var sales, or rather, sorry, this is how you do it, like this. So like that. And then what we can do here is we can just say sales uh, of let's say one or let's say starting starting with zero is equal to whatever this number is now we have specified the length of the array is going to be four and but we only assigned one value the first one so what do you think is going to happen here well as you might imagine and this is what go has been doing is it's just going to give the other three default values. So soul is going to assign them to something. They're just going to be default values. Now, if this bothers you here and you don't know how many uh, el elements that uh, you want to have in your array, what you can very simply do is just say dot, dot, dot. And right there, what that does, and I'm just going to go ahead and this only works when we don't use var, we use the create and assign. So let's just say sales. And then over here, I'm gonna say create and assign. And I'm gonna say over here, dot, dot, dot. And then over here, we can specify all of the different um, array elements. We have to, of course, still specify the type. And then over here, we can just put whatever it is that we want. So what this does is it just calculates exactly how much we have here and it just puts it in that value. Okay, now the last thing that I want to talk about is iterating through an array. So we've used loops to iterate over, you know, numbers and then execute the same code. More often than not, when you use loops, you are iterating over array and you're doing a particular action on each particular element. So let's say over here, I want to iterate over my purchases and I want to log them to the console. So let's go here. I'm going to say four. I'm going to say let i is equal to zero, starting at the index of zero. And then so long as i is less than, so we want i to be less than the overall length of this array. Because if it's less than the overall length of the, the array, which is one, two, three, four, five, that means at the point four, it will iterate through, it'll continue the uh, loop, but at five, which doesn't have the an index, that means it is going to stop. So as long as it is less than the length of the array, and this method right over here is going to allow us to calculate the length of the array. So this right here is going to resolve to five. And then over here, we can just say I plus plus, we can execute some logic. So let's just go here. Let's just say print new line and I can say I. So let's go ahead and run this. You can see we get zero, one, two, three, four. 
uh, sorry, that's because we do not want to print I, we want to actually print the purchases of I. So let's go here. Because this right here is simply the index, we just want to get the purchases of that index and there we go. That is exactly what we get. In this section of the video, we are going to learn about slices. Slices are extremely similar to an array, except they have a variable length. Let me show you exactly what I mean. So let's go over here to the arrays. Now, as you can see here, we have created this array and we have specified that it has a maximum length of five. Now this could be potentially problematic. Let's say I want to add another purchase. I could make multiple purchases in the future. So say I made another purchase and I want to append it to this array. Well, how do I do that? Well, over here, the last element has an index of four. So you might be thinking I could do something like purchases of index of five is equal to 14.33, let's say. Well, this is not going to work. As you can see, we have this little error line. If I hover over it, you can see that the error that we're getting is that it is out of bound. And that's because, well, we can only have five elements. By doing this, we are adding another element, increasing the length to six. Now, of course, I can change this to, to something like three where we reassign the values. But again, we cannot do that. Well, again, this is very problematic. So what can we do to fix this? Well, instead, what we can do is we can just grab a slice of that array. So I'm going to go here and I am going to just copy this array. And let's just go here and say my slice. And I'm going to assign it to the value of purchases. And then what I am going to do is just have the brackets and then colon. So colon like so. So what this is going to do is going to get a slice of this array. And over here, over here in this colon, we're basically saying that we want every single element inside of this array to be put into this slice. So if I went ahead and I did an FM print line, and then I can say my slice, let's just go ahead and run 09 slices you can see we have a slice and it looks really really similar however now we can do some really cool things with this so over here let's say I want to add another value what I can do is I can reassign this to my slice is equal to a function call that is going to be called append and then I'm going to have my slice as the first variable and then the second, uh, uh, second, sorry, the first parameter, and then the second parameters are going to be just the uh, float values that we want to append to my slices. So over here, I can say, let's say, fourteen ninety nine. I made another purchase, fifteen ninety nine, and I can say nineteen ninety nine, like so. And now let's open up our terminal again. You can see that if I were to run this, you can see now we have those values in there. This is something that we cannot do with an array. Now, let's say we do not, we just really just want to define a slice right away. And we do not want to create this array and then create the slice. What we can do is we can actually do the, the both of them at the same time. So over here, let me just comment this out over here. And let me just put purchases here. What we can do is we can say, instead of specifying any number, we can just say an empty array. And what this is going to do is create an array and then it's going to take a slice of that array and then assign it to this variable. So that is just one way we can do it just to avoid this additional um, creation of the array and then creation of the slice. Okay, now let's talk about this syntax a little bit more, this right here, just to really understand it. So let's say I want to have another slice. So my other slice and let's say I want to have the slice from uh, from here. So this number, this number and then this number. So these three numbers. So those are the slices that I want. Well, what I can do here is I can say purchases and then I can say 
I want it from starting from zero. So starting from zero, the index of zero. And then I'm going to say index of, well, we want index of two. So we're going to say index of three. Now this might not make much sense, but the first number is going to actually include this particular element, the first element that we want to slice. However, the last element, the last index, it's not going to include this one. So it's exclusive. So it's going to be two. So if I want from index zero to two, I'm going to say zero to three because zero is going to be inclusive. Three is going to be exclusive. So that way we get these three elements. Now, of course, if I want it from one to two, I'm going to say one to three because that is one again is going to be inclusive. Three is going to be exclusive. We're going to get this. So I'm going to go back to zero. Let's go ahead and print this now, my other slice. Uh, let's open up a terminal. Now you can see here we have these three values. Looking good, looking good. Now, because we are starting from the very beginning of the array, we can actually, um, we can actually uh, simplify this by simply removing the zero. So this is saying that well, start at two. I just want everything from two and then to, to the front. So starting from the very beginning of the array, go from the very beginning of the array to the index of two. That is what it is saying. So let's go ahead and define another slice. And let's say for this slice, I want to get, um, let's say this element right over here and then every other element after it. So over here, I'm going to say my third slice. I'm going to say that that is going to be equal to, I'm going to say purchase. And then I can say, well, two, two. And then that is basically what I can say here. So I can say from two. So index of two, because it's inclusive. And then I want everything afterwards. So that is why I'm not specifying anything after that. So I can go here, my third slice my and i didn't define it i forgot to do that my third slice if i were to run this you can see we start out here and we get everything afterwards looking good looking good and i hope that makes sense why we only have a colon here because colon here is saying okay we just want everything from the start of the array to the end of the array now the last thing i want to show you is we have used this append to start adding things together we can also use append to combine two slices together. So let's say I want to combine two slices together. Uh, so I'm going to say append, and then I'm going to say my other slice, and then I'm going to say dot, 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 or sorry, my third slice, dot, dot, dot. So what that is going to do is we're going to have my other slice, and then my third slice, dot, 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 whatever values are in my third slice, which are these values right over here, it's just going to spread them in there. So this is equivalent to this right here. So this is equivalent to this. All right, hope that makes sense. And just for proof, let's just go ahead and print this out. I'm gonna go ahead and try to just print out one. So just combine. Let's see if we can remove my slice. Yes, okay, looking good. So let's just go ahead and print out combine and that's just going to combine those two together. In this section of the course, we're going to talk about another data structure called maps. Maps are a way where we can store data in a key value pair fashion. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example. So let's say in my program, I have some sort of shopping cart. And what I want to do is I want to store the item that is in our shopping cart as well as the quantity. So it could look a little something like this. So let's say I want to buy a lamp and then the quantity could be, let's say three. And also I have a bowl and the quantity in this case is one. And then over here, I also have a laptop. The quantity is always one. In this case, you can take, kind of take a look at this data structure and you can see that this value is assigned to this value over here. They're both related. So this right here is a key value pair. This is the key and this is the value of the pair. So we have key, value, key, value. 
Now, in case of maps, and this is what we are going to create with a map, the key always has to be the exact same type. In this case, it's a string. And then the value also has to be the exact same type. In this case, it is an integer. Now, the key doesn't always have to be a string. It could be an integer, could be even a Boolean value for some reason. And then the value over here could be anything as well, so long as they are all the same. So let's go ahead and define the shopping cart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say cart. I'm going to go ahead, declare and assign. And I'm going to call the make function to make my map. Now in here, I'm going to specify that I want to create a map. And then I'm going to specify the types of the key value pairs. So I'm going to say string. So inside of these square brackets, that's going to be string. And that's going to be for the key. And then it's going to be int for the value. So that's outside of the square brackets. So we have just created our, ma our uh, map, our cart map. But now what we want to do is we want to start adding values to it. So the first thing that we can do with a map is write things to it. So I can say here cart of lamp. So over here, I'm assigning the key with these square brackets is going to have the value of three. I can go over here and say of bowl is going to have the value of one. And let me go ahead and just print this out. So let's print this out, sprint out this cart just to see how it looks like. And let's just go, go, actually, I think I have that here. Go run maps. You can see we get this nice little data structure where we have the key, the value, the key, the value. Looking good, looking good. Another thing that we can actually do is something like this. So let's say cart, laptop, and then I can say plus equals one. So whatever this is originally equal to, add one to it. Now you might be thinking, well, but you don't have anything that is equal to laptop. So what it's going to do is it's going to assign this value to zero, the default integer value, and then add one to it. So if I go here, you can see we have, if I were to save it, you can see we should have laptop now. Okay, so that is writing to it. Now let's talk about reading to it. So over here, let's say I want to access the lamp. So they want to ask us how much we have in here. So I can say here, lap, lamp quantity. And I'm going to say that that is going to be equal to cart of lamp. Very simple. Over here, if I were to do that, just say lamp quantity. Of course, I have to create an assign here. I should get three as I do. Now, another cool thing about this is it's actually going to give us two different variables. So it's going to give us this over here, which is the value, but I can also access another variable. We can call it whatever it is that we want, but I'm going to call this found. And what this does is it gives us the Boolean value as to whether this key value pair actually exists in the map. So over here, in this case, it does exist. So let's go here and let's go ahead and say, you can see here that it says true. However, if it doesn't exist, so let's just say I say book for some reason, it's going to give me, it's going to give me the default value, which is zero. And then it's going to give me false. It doesn't exist. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I actually go ahead and create a book with a value of zero? So I'm going to say book, I'm going to say equal to zero. If I were to do it now, you can see it gives me the value of zero, but this time it gives me true because it actually does exist inside of my cart. I just assigned it to zero. All right. So that is reading. So reading. The last thing that we got to talk about is how we can delete key value pairs. And this one is pretty easy as well. So to delete key value pairs, we're just going to call the delete keyword pass in the map where we want to delete something and then we pass in the key. So let's say I want to delete laptop. That's all we have to do. Very simple. So let's go ahead and run this again. Now you can see we do not have a laptop anymore. Now, one thing that is very important to understand are these things aren't ordered. So if you decide to iterate over them, you might get a different order for each time. So let's say you iterate over them. The first thing that you get is lamp, then you get laptop, then you get book, then you get bowl. 
and then you iterate over them again maybe next time you're going to get book bowl laptop lamp so it's different from an array or a slice where the elements are ordered so over here they're just key value pairs and they are not ordered the last thing that I want to discuss are pointers. So to describe pointers, let's go take a look at an example. So let's say I declare a variable a and I assign it to the value of one. I then declare another variable and then I assign it to the value of a. So let's just go ahead and print this out just to see what it looks like originally. Now, as you can probably imagine, a is going to be one and then b is also going to be one as well. So let's just go ahead here. Let's print that. Let's do a quick clear, print it again. And then you can see here we have one, one. Now what is going to happen when I increment B by like one? So how, what's going to happen here? Let's go ahead and print this out. And as you might expect, B changes to two. However, A stays at one. And that's because when we declare in this fashion, what ends up happening is we get a copy of A and we assign it to this value B. So this is a whole new piece of data. It's not linked to it in any way. However, sometimes we want to link a particular variable to an existing variable. And this is where pointers come into place. So let's go over here. I'm going to say var C. And I'm going to say that this is equal to one. I am then going to assign another variable var D. However, this time I'm not going to straight up assign it to C. What I'm going to do is I'm going to specify that it is going to be an integer. And then I'm going to say star. And what this means is that this is going to be a pointer. It's going to point to a particular variable. And this variable is going to be an integer. I can then, if I want to, say D is equal to, and then if I want to specify the pointer, I say the and sign and then C, like so. So we have var D, and then over here we have specified that it is going to be a pointer, and then we say D is equal to the and sign uh, C. Now this is giving us an issue. So over here we're saying D is declared but not used. That's okay, we can just use it over here. So now what do you think is going to happen when I decide to increment D? So let's go over here and I'm going to say, actually, you know what, let's get rid of it from the console. I am gonna go ahead and increment D. Now if you want to increment a pointer, you're gonna say star D, the pointer D, plus equals and then one. So let's just go ahead and log what actually C is in this case. So in this case, C is actually going to be two, even though we have not worked directly with it because we are pointing to it and then we are mutating it. You can see that C is now, uh, uh, C is now two. Now, why would we ever want to do this? Well, we want to do this if we do not want to store this other piece of data again in memory. Because remember, when we do this over here, what we are doing is we are creating a copy. Now, if we do not want to create a copy, we can just very simply point to it. And it's just going to point to the original variable that is already stored in memory. So we don't have to store any more data in memory. And this is ideal when we're passing things to a function. Instead of passing the parameter as is, which would create a copy, we can just say point to it. And if the parameter is some large array, we're saving a lot of space in memory.